Such is the reluctance of the Scottish system of justice to right the wrongs that some people suffer, that restitution of a mistake may not take months, nor years, but decades. The man in the street rarely realises this sad truth. This is one man who has learned this lesson the hard way. If there ever was a victim of the intricacies of the Scottish system of law, it is Mr. Eddie Milne who lives in Forfarm. Over the past two decades, his case has become so complicated that it is difficult now to define exactly what it is. He has dealt with every level of the court system. He has dealt with the Minister of Justice in Edinburgh on several occasions and he's dealt with the Scottish Criminal Case Review Commission in Glasgow twice. He has contacted members of parliament many times and wrestled with the details of both the Freedom of Information Act and the Data Protection Act. And yet his basic complaint is very simple. In 1986, Eddie Milne was employed as the manager of Castle Motors in Forfa. He was told he had to put the business on a firm financial footing. It had been losing money. Before I went there, things at the company were run sort of willy-nilly and, you know, people were able to jump, do it, go in to help petty cash and things like this to resolve matters and the company was losing thousands of pounds a year and the owners were pumping money into the business. When I went there, I blocked all procedures as far as spending money was concerned and everything had to be approved by myself or my secretary who I, I knew I could trust as far as that's concerned. Eddie Milne ran a tight ship and turned the business around. He discovered that petrol was being stolen by the workforce so he reported it to the police. Unfortunately this involved a man with whom Eddie had had an argument. Not long after taking over Castle Motors he had had a visit from this man, who was prominent in local legal circles. He had bought a car some two years or so previously from the company before I went there, and it had broken down somewhere outside Blackpool on the motorway, had to be pulled off the motorway, and had to be repaired, and there was expenses, bed and breakfast for him and his family, and such forth. And he came back into cast, the car wasn't, the guarantee was out of the car and he hadn't taken an extended warranty on it and he walked into Castle Motors to William Deere who was the service manager and expected Castle Motors just to pay for it. And uh, there was obviously an argument developed between myself and him and the, ser and the service manager. The argument was to have fateful consequences. Eddie lost his temper and threw the official out accusing him of trying to defraud the company. Two years or so after this incident, the local trading standards office raided Castle Motors. They claimed that demonstration models had had their speedometers turned back. They claimed that records of the use of petrol proved it. Eddie Milne claimed that the missing petrol had been simply stolen by his workforce. He had reported these thefts to the police. In pre-trial discussion, Eddie Milne was told that he would be charged rather than the company. And when he appeared before the sheriff court in Forfar, Eddie Milne was astonished to find that one member of the Crown team was the same person who had demanded free repairs on his car a couple of years before. To me now, realising what was going on, that was a clear conflict of interest. Uh, Luke taking the law into consideration and should never, he should never have been allowed to attempt to prosecute me. Eddie spoke to his defence lawyers about this apparent conflict of interest. They told him the Crown case relied solely on witness evidence. The Crown could not prove their case with documentation, so they said Eddie should not worry about the presence of his adversary. I actually asked the, the court solicitor, Hamilton, and I, they said, oh, no matter for that, all we have to do is there was nothing wrong with the vehicles, but that we knew that already because the paperwork, there was no proof of, as far as the paperwork was concerned. It was only on witness statements. However, Eddie Milne was found guilty, fined £2,000 
and ordered to pay costs. He refused to pay. The company went and paid the fine for me, uh, and I, against my objections, I didn't want the fine paid, I wanted to back into court. Perhaps the defence team had been correct about the case, but when he gave evidence to the court, an enraged Eddie Milne was his own worst enemy. Faced by a man with whom he'd had a great argument, he lost his temper. He considered the man's presence to be an abuse of the power of the Crown. His solicitor was later to say of him, he was nervous and he ended up giving an appalling account of himself that did him no favours whatsoever. It was the most appalling testimony I have ever witnessed and I think it effectively led to Eddie Milne being convicted. They saw no grounds of appeal. The thing is, I, I asked my court solicitor and the QC at the time, is within seconds of walking out of the, the dock, for an appeal to go ahead. And all they turned around and said, look, there's nothing to appeal on, the whole case has been a farce. Uh, there's nothing to appeal on. You must have a, you must be able to appeal something on a point of law. Uh, and as I said, being naive and ignorant, I knew nothing of wh wh where that would come in as far as my case is concerned. In spite of this advice, Eddie Milne got down to work. He was determined to appeal. He wrote to several MPs and was finally told to take his case to the newly formed Scottish Criminal Case Review Commission. His actions were attracting publicity. I wrote into the Criminal Case Review Commission and we put in an appeal to them and uh, I was told that they were investigating, the chap come, the chap come to, legal officer come to see me, gave, I gave him all the details and such forth. Then in 2001 I got the, uh, my case turned down by them. I asked for various reviews, again these things were all just brushed aside as far as I was concerned. Castle Motors closed down and a supermarket took its place. Eddie Milne began to look around for other work. He offered to help his former secretary in setting up a car sales business in Dundee. And then, two years after the conviction, Eddie Milne received a letter from the Trading Standards Office in Forfar. The Director of Fair Trading was now requesting him to sign a declaration that he would not consent to or connive at a course of action that would commit an offence under the Trade Descriptions Act. It was clear that if Eddie Milne signed this, no one would take his pleas of innocence seriously. Eddie Milne refused to sign anything, saying he'd not been guilty of the offences in the first place. He did not work after this. What money he and his wife had was invested in a small grocery shop in Forfar, which his wife ran with him helping out. Much of his time was now spent at home working on his case. He applied to the Scottish Criminal Case Review Commission for a second time. But the news from Glasgow was now gloomy. The stipulated time for holding documents was now past. Many had been thrown away or simply lost. Memories were now fading about what happened in the courtroom in 1989. The man in the Crown service who had had the argument with him about the car had also forgotten all about it, so even though the discussion about possible conflict of interest was a matter of record. Well, they have, they have turned me down again, but they have ignored the conflicts of interest a problem that I had. They have made no reference to uh, to that. They, say, they have said, if, according to their paperwork, nobody seems to remember anything, according to the, the Commission's reports. And as, as I say, I feel this is what's been going 